Hey VC, what's up? It's me, yours truly. I am back to post a quick video here. Just another random finds video. You know, stuff that's kind of come in over the past few weeks or so. Um, you know, kind of at this stage in my collecting, there's not really, there's not a ton of stuff that always comes in, you know, that I'm always picking up. So I, I use just most of the time when I dig, I don't expect to find stuff. But it seems like this past couple weeks, there's been so much stuff coming in that, uh, you know, for the first time in a long time, I've used up all, almost all my credit at both shops. So that just doesn't happen very often. So that in and of itself is just kind of a, a more, a bit of an exciting week for me from a, from a digging standpoint, a week or two. But um, yeah, and really kind of nothing crazy, outrageous or anything like that, but just some nice core stuff, some some nice OG pressings, a um, couple of reissues, and just really kind of very random. But uh, I want to start off by giving a little bit of thanks to a friend who hadn't spoken to in a little while, but, uh, you know, with COVID and everything else, but they were moving, sold their house and called me up and said, hey, got a big old box of CDs want to get rid of, you know, would love for you if you want them, would love for you to come grab them so we don't have to move these things, that kind of thing. And I was like, heck yeah, I'll be over. So I uh, picked up a nice batch of about 120 CDs or so. Um, just, want, just want to kind of show a few there really quick. Uh, the one cool thing about it was, you know, a lot of just kind of core stuff in there too, but uh, a lot of OG CDs in there. And typically I don't care much about the OG CD thing. You know, if it's a BMG or original, whatever, I usually don't care that much. Um, like when it comes to deluxe CDs, especially the ones with the slip cases and all of that, yeah, I'm all about that. Uh, Japanese CDs, MoFi CDs, oh, heck yeah. But after those three, yeah, really could care less if it's a BMG or OG. But when I do stumble across OG CDs, I will replace, you know, maybe a BMG CD that I might have. So here are a couple of really, just a really cool... OG ones that were in there, you know, the Cars, Heartbeat City, I really won't spend any time on these, they're all pretty, pretty darn common, Tears for Fear, Songs from the Big Chair, The Best of Blondie, Aerosmith Get a Grip, now these were kind of cool, like the Rush Presto, those were very nice OG pressing of that, as well as Moving Pictures, and there's a few other Rush in there too, I haven't processed yet, um, the Outfield, really cool album here, Two Voices of Babylon. That one definitely gets overlooked a bit, but it has my one of my favorite songs by them, which is My Paradise. A uh, very nice copy of Miles Davis, Kind of Blue. And this was some type of special pressing of that, and I can't remember off the top of my head what it was. But anyway, uh, Best of Simon and Garfunkel, kind of the Best of Soul Asylum. There was a ton of these in there, like, you know, all the, now that's that's what I call Music 15 and all the MTV Party to Go and all that stuff. So there's a few of those I'm definitely going to keep because there was some good stuff in there. But uh, Creed, Human Clay, and Visions of Peace by Ravi Shankar there, which is kind of cool. I, I haven't really had an opportunity to get any of his stuff on vinyl or CD. I have some burnt CDs, but... Um, yeah, nice to finally have a piece in there. Two CD set, and I listened to both of them a few days ago, and it's a, it's a really cool album. Long album, but it's good. So, uh, yes, I just want to you know give her a big thanks for thinking about me and you know getting those CDs over because they will definitely be well taken care of in my collection. Um, but let's jump over to some of the vinyl, which is like quite a few things that have kind of come in. So I won't spend a ton of time on each one, but a couple I do want to kind of say a couple things about. So we'll start off with two re really exciting uh, reissues. Now we'll talk about those for a quick second. But the first one here is uh, Karen Dalton. It's so hard to tell who's loving you the best or who's going to love you the best. I'm sorry. Um, had no idea this was being reissued for Record Store Day just because, I mean, I, I just, I don't get into Record Store Day anymore at all. You know, the first six or seven years when I was collecting vinyl, record store days were awesome. And my ex and I, we used to actually like travel all over the place for record store days. But now it's just, I don't know, just hearing record store days kind of a turn off for me. I just, I don't like most of the things about it. The only thing I do love about it is what it does for stores from a business standpoint. 
But really outside of that, almost everything else about it now has just become one huge turnoff for me. So record store days don't even register with me unless they need me to work. That's, that's it. Um, but so I had no idea this had, this had been reissued. But Dylan from Noble Records was talking about this album months ago because he had found an original copy of it. And, you know, Dylan knows this stuff. He always introduces me to a lot of different different music. And uh, I was like, I'm going to check that out, you know, based off what he said. And I went and listened to some stuff online, thought it was awesome, went to look at Discogs, and was like, whoa, you know, the price of these those things were just outrageous. So I thought, well, screw it. I, I'm okay with the CD on that. I just kind of want the music. The CDs were freaking outrageous, <laughs> you know. So I was like, well, I guess we just won't have that one for a while. So to stumble, to so to find out that they did a Record Store Day reissue, was absolutely awesome and the album sounds just like the cover looks which is awesome and the easiest way to describe it in, in my opinion is imagine you have a flower power hippie you know Joni Mitchell acoustic guitar type of female singer who's been doing all the flower power song singer songwriter folk stuff and then wakes up one day and goes I think I'll, I think I'll cover some blues songs today and just without skipping a beat just going right into playing and singing blues songs like that's kind of the feel that you get from from this particular album. But it's definitely different, definitely cool, and you know, I, I really enjoy discovering this album. So thanks a lot for that one, Dylan. Uh, now the next one here too, this is one that there's very few times right now when I'm ever looking through the stacks and something makes me go, oh, you know, just at this stage in my collecting, it just doesn't happen very often. So the fact that this album made me do that, and it's not even a pricey album or anything, it's not a grail or anything of that nature, was pretty awesome. And it was a self-titled Collective Soul from 1995. And this was the 20, 25th, 25th anniversary edition. And the reason this album made me do that is because, number one, it's my favorite Collective Soul album. I, I've, I've loved this album since the day it came out back in 95. And... Um, if you go back and look at any of my old videos from like, you know, nine, 10 plus years ago and, you know, really kind of studied them, you would find there's probably about 15 or 20 albums that I repeatedly talked about. I wish they would press on vinyl. I, what I would do if they would actually, you know, issue it on vinyl. And this was one that always popped up in that, that conversation for me. So again, had no idea it had been pressed and just to be digging through the stacks and all of a sudden see that pop out, I was like, oh my gosh, finally. So uh, again, my, my favorite album by them, you know, songs like The World I Know, December, Where the River Flows, just, you know, fantastic, fantastic album. Um, I wish they would go back and issue slash reissue their entire catalog because I mean, Collective Soul is a fantastic band in, in my opinion. But so, so happy to have that. I think there was a there was one pressing that was on like turquoise vinyl or something like that. And then the black vinyl pressing. And I think the turquoise one was a UK, I think. Don't quote me on that. But I, I think it was. But, uh, but yeah. And something in my vinyl sense, like my Spidey sense, something in my vinyl sense tells me this is going to be one of those albums that two years from now, three years from now, it's going to be out of print. And it's going to be going for like three hundred dollars, uh, which is why I haven't opened it. You know, I mean, I listen to the CD all the time, so I mean, I'm comfortable with how much I get to listen to the album. So I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna keep that shrink on there for a little while and just be very, very happy that's that's finally in the collection. But I love it. Just even seeing that on the you know twelve by twelve cover just makes me happy. <laughs> so that was that was a very exciting pickup right there. Now, just kind of going through some of the OG stuff that I picked up, starting here with Metallica. Of course, Injustice for All, you guys know all about this album. This is a 1988 U.S. pressing, 2LP with the inner sleeves in pretty good condition. Um, you know, I have a Warner, Warner Brothers copy of this, but I, I've been trying to get all the OG pressings, you know, with Metallica, uh, not not worrying about like the silver label mega force, but like kind of all the electras from the early years and all of that. And so this is just kind of one that I needed. And right now I'm really close because all I need is a, I need an OG pressing of reload and an OG pressing of the black album. Like right now I have reissues of both of those, but then my OG Metallica will be complete. 
And it's kind of funny because it, it really made me think. You know, we were having some conversations about this at the um, at, the, at the shop the other day. You know, I, I started collecting vinyl. Like, I'm not one of those guys who's been doing it for 30, 40 years since I was a kid, that type of thing, like some guys in the VC have. Um, I, I started, you know, not not too long ago. Let's just put it that way. But basically, I started collecting right about four or five years before the resurgence really kicked in, uh, when I really got into just buying a lot of vinyl. So vinyl wasn't big yet, and you didn't have all the reissues taking place, and there still wasn't a gigantic value on a lot of stuff. So even when I look at my grails, you know, 80%, 85% of my grails were things that were bought before I even knew what a grail was, you know. And that's kind of what we were talking about was, you know, like, for example, I have a very, very nice near mint copy of uh, Judas Priest Painkiller. You know, I paid eight dollars for that. I just keep little tabs on the back to how much I paid for something, or how much I thought it was worth. You know, for the longest time, it had eight dollars written on the back. Um, Stone Temple Pilots Purple, you know, another great example. I paid twelve dollars for it, a, a mint copy of that. And just on and on and on. So it's like all these awesome albums that I have that I paid pennies for compared to what they're worth today. But then on the flip side, you know, so that's kind of the positive that happened without knowing. But then on the flip side, talking about these OGs with Metallica makes me think about some of the stupid things I did because I didn't know, such as having an original black pre black album pressing. I got it. I got online for twelve dollars. I found another pressing, and I was like, yeah, I'm kind of comparing these two. This seems to be in a little bit better condition. This, so I'll get rid of this one. Well, the one that I got rid of was a Vertigo Swirl Black Album, <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh my gosh, just to, to think about that just makes you nauseous, but it's like, I didn't know a Black Album was a Black Album back then, so so anyway, I don't know, it just made me, made me think about that when we, we started talking about these OG pressings and stuff like that, it's not only the good things that you've done, but sometimes the stupid things you've done in, in your past as well. But so anyway, but yeah, so that that's a nice addition. Also grabbed an OG pressing of uh, Death Magnetic. I actually went out and bought a copy of this the day it came out back in 2008. But for some stupid reason, the pressing I got, the center label was stuck on it, like off to the side, like all the way into the dead wax. And I remember when I went through my purge phase, I was like, eh, I guess that's worthy of purge. But so nice to get a copy of that back in. And this is actually a sealed copy, which is nice. So uh, not only an OG pressing, but a sealed copy there. Power Slave, Maiden, 84 US pressing. Another nice piece there. And this was one I just couldn't pass up. Roxy Music, Avalon. Definitely my favorite album by them. You know, I picked up that box set that they put out a little while ago, which is very well made. It's a beautiful set. But when I saw this, you know, pressing that had the shrink and the uh, the hype sticker on there, I just had to look it up. And I was like, if that's an OG pressing, I got to grab that. And sure as heck, it, it's, an, it's an 82 U.S. pressing. So considering that's my favorite album, I figured why not? Um, love this album to death. I mean, more than this and Avalon are still just two of the... The most fantastic songs ever from the 80s. Definitely my favorite Roxy Music album. And it's still the cover that gives me the creeps. I don't know what it is about that cover that just makes my stomach turn. But um, love it. And last two OG pressings here. Little Prince. Dirty Mind. Again, have the 180 gram reissue, but it was nice to find the earlier pressing here. Um, I lo love, especially this particular cover, I love looking at it because it always makes me just, I don't know, just, just again, points to the genius of Prince because what it always makes me think about is this is like his second album, or I guess if you count that all for you or whatever, I guess it's technically his third or whatever, but I mean, he still, he wasn't Prince the icon Prince at this point in time. So when you think about just like the stuff he was doing with the, you know, the fluffy high heel shoes and this those little three foot ten, you know, light skinned little scrawny dude getting on the front of an album cover and like a G string and a coat and 
it's just kind of like, God, the balls to pull that off, or the balls to do it, number one, but then on top of that, to make it work and become like one of the biggest icons and, and you know, it's like the tiniest guy in the world becoming one of the biggest sex symbols in the world. Like, like nothing about that was supposed to work. And yet he made it work to a degree that probably even he didn't imagine. But uh, I don't know, just whenever I see these early album covers and everything, it just always makes me think about this, especially especially Dirty Mind. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, great songs like Uptown on here, uh, When You Were Mine, which is also a great track that Cindy Lauper, you know, covered on She's So Unusual. But um, great album there. And then it's another early pressing here with um, Controversy. Yeah, another fantastic album. Private Joy, title track Controversy, a few other things. So. That's kind of some of the OG stuff that's come in. All right, so now I'm just kind of going through really just random, random crap. Slade. This is Come On, Feel the Hits. 2LP, it's kind of a greatest hits album. If you don't have any other Slade, this is definitely a very good piece to have. It has most of their core stuff. Um, of course, I mean, if anyone happens not to know, you know, Come On, Feel the Noise, that everyone knows from Quiet Riot being such a big major hit. That was a cover of Come On, Feel the Noise by, by Slade, as well as Mama, We're All Crazy Now. You know, Quiet Riot got that from Slade, too. Yeah, but just kind of a, a you know, cool group early on, just kind of doing some things that, that just made them Slade. I mean, it's just kind of hard to describe. You just have to kind of listen to them. But that's a very nice piece. A little hip-hop here. LL Cool J Radio. Very nice. 1985 U.S. pressing. So a very nice OG pressing with the hype sticker there, which is cool. But uh, yeah, early LL, you know, back in the, what I, I refer to as the raw days of hip hop, uh, just here's a beat and I'll just start saying some lyrics. And, uh, and LL was one of the first two to really kind of do what I, I personally refer to as the you know, power rap, if you will, where, uh, you know, just kind of the more angry, energetic, like, you know, just the grr type of type of thing. And this album really kind of set set that tone for him as well. But fantastic, fantastic album there. Another nice hip hop piece, 20th anniversary reissue of Nelly, Country Grammar. Classic album, you know, it's kind of a huge crossover album just in terms of like the the dance hip hop thing. Uh, I remember when I used to bounce at a club. This is one of those albums that we heard all the time between a uh, ride with me and country grammar. Like those songs spun every freaking night. But a uh, very cool two OP set. You know, good good sounding pressing as well, which is kind of nice. There's the other uh, two LP, just regular black vinyl. Then there's also kind of a it's not a box set, but kind of like an expanded booklet kind of set that has that comes on blue vinyl, I believe. Uh, it has a few extra tracks on it, that type of thing. But but yeah, so another great reissue there. And again, just kind of all over the place here. The Cure Greatest Hits. Got a couple of Greatest Hits albums here. Uh, so the first one here is The Cure. And again, just kind of pick this up too, because you know, you have you have artists like this that have so many albums that are great and have fantastic songs spread all across them and some days when you just kind of want some music on and you don't want to say get up and flip records and everything because you want to go through all the hits it's nice to have a nice greatest hits on hand just to kind of be able to sit back and listen to all of them but nice 2LP set you know has everything on it from you know close to me uh, just like heaven which of course is in my opinion the greatest pop song of all time uh, love song, you know, Friday, I'm in love, um, boys don't cry, so the walk, just kind of a little bit of everything there. So very, very cool, cool set. If you don't have any other cure in your collection, this is definitely a very solid album to get your hands on. So that's one greatest hits. And there's also exact same thing for the exact same reasons with the white stripes greatest hits. Nice two LP set with kind of just their hits. A couple LPs there, so that's also nice. Uh, let's see. Peter Tosh, Legalize It. 
you're not familiar with this album, you know, and, and if you are, well, if you're a reggae fan, I'm sure you are, because Peter Tosh is kind of a big name. Um, you know, but Peter was part of, you know, Bob Marley and the Wailers and all of that. I mean, that's the vein that he comes from. So, you know, the skills and the type of music and the the level of perfection he was used to being around. Uh, and this album kind of takes off in that same vein. But um, yeah, just one, just one of my favorite reggae albums. You can see him sitting in the middle of a field of marijuana. Legalize it. So funny. But yeah, fantastic album. Just found this for like five bucks, which was very awesome. Very, very nice condition. And staying on kind of the reggae thing, there's one other one here, which is Bob Marley and the Wailers. This is Babylon Bus. This is the seventh, 75th anniversary, which is insane. I can't, this is not 75 years old. It's crazy, but um, but yeah, I mean, just a fantastic, fantastic album. Uh, one of I'm not a huge fan of live albums, which you've heard me say that a number of times over the years. But this this freaking album just really captures what made Bob Marley and the Wailers so special, especially live. Uh, just such a powerful album. You just you really feel like you're there at at the concert. Um, and it's kind of nice too, because, you know, I've always said, if you don't have any reggae or any Bob Marley and the Wailers, Legend is definitely the best album to start with, because it's kind of just the very greatest hits, the, the most accessible Bob Marley and the Wailers stuff, you know, the easiest stuff to take in and, and listen to if you're not familiar or not really into reggae or whatever else. After Legend, this would probably be the next one on my list. You know, Exodus is kind of right there, but this would definitely be the next one on my list for that. So, fantastic album. And this is that 2LP, you know, Abbey Road, half mat, half speed remastering. Haven't actually spun it yet, but I've heard these things sound absolutely fantastic. So, I'm certainly looking forward to it. All right. Uh, let's see. Still kind of jumping around here. A little Everclear. This is the very best of, you know, Everclear is a strange band for me too, because this is one of those bands that I just never really liked, like, like them, you know, and there's no explanation behind it. They didn't do anything. Like they didn't say something that pissed me off or, but it's just sometimes you just get like a weird feeling about something and Everclear is just one of those bands. Like I just don't like them <laughs> it, uh, internally, you know, get, can't explain it, but, um, uh, you know, I remember the first time I heard Santa Monica, I thought that was just an absolute killer track. And they do have a lot of other good songs. And again, it's a band that I've always supported, bought their albums and all of that. But it's just one of those kind of like the cover I was explaining with Roxy Music. I can't explain why that makes me feel that way, but it just kind of does. And same thing with Everclear as a band. I don't know. <laughs> but good. <laughs> it's a good piece there. Uh, what else here? Oh, speaking of the live albums, you got Blondie Live. And the main reason I picked this one up is because um, because of the song Maria, because the, that that particular album um, exits has they haven't I don't think they've ever released it on vinyl that I'm aware of. And Maria is one of my absolute favorite songs by them. Um, but yeah, so when I saw that was on here, I kind of, you know, got on my phone and and listened to it online. So I wanted to make sure it was a live album that sounded decent, because that's one of the main reasons I can't stand live albums is when bands don't even really seem to try and it's like, good, that's, you know, that sounds horrible. But, uh, the couple of tracks I checked out, including Maria sounded pretty good. So I thought, okay, this is a live album. I'll give it a try. So I haven't actually spun it yet, but we'll try to get around to that this week. Hopefully. Heat sweat, <laughs> make it last forever. One of my favorite R and B albums from back in the late '80s, um, '87 actually. Love every single song on here. I mean, if you're a Keith fan, you know. If you're not a Keith fan, I guess maybe you don't. But Keith was just uh, one of the Mr. Cools from back in the day. Actually, he wasn't cool. He was very nerdy, but his nerdiness came off very cool. So <laughs> I guess that's what it was. Uh, Motley Crue, Doctor Feelgood. 
you know, it finally got out a, a good reissue of these. So just based on the fact that it's taken so long to do it, I went ahead and picked one up just just because. But uh, does sound great, you know, which is awesome. But that's just that. And here's a nice one that Billy Hurst actually introduced me to because I was not familiar with this band or sorry with this album. Uh, Bob Seeger System. This is Mongrel. I, I didn't know anything about Seeger's early, early career. I mean, every everybody knows old time rock and roll and night moves and all that stuff that back when he kind of, you know, was huge, huge. But uh, I had no idea about that early, early career. And so Billy kind of schooled me on this a little bit. And, uh, you know, I picked this up the other night. Uh, really cool stuff. Definitely a very different sound than what he eventually, not very, very different, but different enough for sure. Um, I think this was his... Is it second album, second or third album, something like that. But um, yeah, so just a really cool discovery for me and awesome stuff there. And then so I got three more here. Contours, Do You Love Me? Again, it's another one of those classic R&B dance albums I've just been needing to pick up. Um, I wish it was an OG pressing in this condition, but just a, a reissue, but still, I found it just for a couple of dollars, so perfect condition, so that was nice. Fun album to listen to. I mean, most people tend to only know the song, Do You Love Me, of course, which is which was huge, but uh, it's just really one of those just kind of all-around dance albums. Like, it, there's no, there's not really any type of slow, lovey R&B type of stuff, classic R&B or anything like that. It's just all get up and dance type of music. So if you like that stuff, make sure you check out that album. Grace Jones, Warm Leatherette. And this is the, um, the U.S. pressing, but it's also like the second cover. There were two different covers they did to this. So I was kind of happy to find this one. Uh, and like with all the Grace Jones stuff that I always say, you know, this on a typical day, you know, seeing a little bit of wear up there and kind of some wear down there. This is an album that I, I wouldn't grab to bring into my collection, to, to kind of where my standards are in terms of condition. But with Grace, like her stuff just does not pop up very often at all. And if it does, it's usually just shredded to no end. So anything I find by her that's a BG plus or you know anywhere close to that, you can kind of just have to grab and just hold on to it, hoping you'll find maybe a near mint copy at some point, because those things just do not come along. Um, but yeah, you know, Grace is my girl. Always talk about her creativity, her style, her, you know, her just being her, you know. So that was a great pickup as well. And then a couple of nice jazz pieces. Blue World by John Coltrane. This has been out for a while, actually. I just never really grabbed it out of the shop. But um, yeah, as I said here, it's just kind of some previously unreleased music. Uh, some stuff was just like different takes from things on other albums and all of that. So definitely all still back in his traditional jazz realm. Like nothing on here flows into his his free jazz and more experimental stage, which I really tend to like myself. But, you know, Coltrane's the man, period. And of course, the one and only Donald Byrd. And this is Chant from 1961. Now, this is one of those new tone poet uh, pressings. So I haven't actually had a chance to spin it yet, uh, but I've heard absolute wonderful things about them. So uh, this is kind of my first first taste of what the, the tone poet pressings are like. And I uh, hope if I really enjoy it, because I would really like to pick up some more of these too, because they're, they're pretty, pretty awesome pressings from what I've heard. But, you know, Bird's the man. Everyone knows him. Absolute legend in the jazz world. So... So, all right. So there you go, VC. That's kind of a, uh, that's the update in terms of things that have kind of come in. So as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in and we will talk to you soon. All right. Take care, guys.